Next Door Neighbors is made possible by the support of the Nissan Foundation. Sometimes you feel I'm not American enough and I'm not Mexican enough. Any individual that truly looks for acceptance, for respect, for mutual relationship, healthy relationship should reach outside his comfort zones. You kind of have to carve out your own way and your own identity and navigate not being exactly like your peers. I am proud to be Syrian and Muslim and American at the same time because Syrian is my roots. You, you should never deny your roots. Birthplace, religion, ethnicity, these are just some of the things people use to define themselves. For many, they're points of pride. They allow us to experience something bigger than ourselves, a sense of unity and belonging. But there's a flip side to belonging. Our cultural identity can also be used to separate those who don't belong to the group, to lump other people together in ways that satisfy stereotypes but ignore a person's individuality. In this edition of Next Door Neighbors, we'll examine the lives of several Middle Tennesseans who grapple with what it means to belong, to be foreign born and still fit in. How does a sense of belonging contribute to our well-being? What do you have to do to obtain full membership into society? And what happens when rules and attitudes change? We begin with the story of a man who came to Tennessee many years ago. For decades, he never questioned his place in the community. Then his home country became front page news. In many ways, Mazen al Qiyami embodies the American dream. When he was 18 years old, he crossed an ocean hoping to find freedom and opportunity in the United States. Today, he walks from his house to his car and drives to work at the car dealership he owns. Okay. I've lived in Murfreesboro a little over 37 years. I moved from Damascus, Syria. Uh, it was 1980. Back in 1980, prior to getting into the car business, Mazen was training to become an airplane pilot, and Murfreesboro, Tennessee was still a relatively small town with just over 30,000 residents. Today, its population has more than quadrupled. The growth has been good for business, but it was that small town hospitality that won him over. In fact, he still likes to stop at the local airfield just to enjoy the good memories and friendly faces. My first impression of the people of Murfreesboro, they are so nice. I remember that very well. They are friendly. They take their time with you. If you didn't say something correctly, they helped you, corrected you. They didn't laugh at you. It seemed like it was not an issue at all. The fact that you're from a different country, um, the fact that you're Muslim, of course, each generation is a product of an era. In recent years, the civil war in Syria and the threat from terror groups like ISIS have produced increased scrutiny towards Muslim immigrants and Syrian refugees in particular. Likewise, in 1979, a year before Mazen came to the U.S., we had the Iran hostage crisis. Well, there were some people that didn't welcome uh, somebody that's from outside. They would holler out of the window and say, go home, Iranian. I'm not Iranian. What would I do in Iran? I've never been to Iran. Some of them would be hostile and, and don't want you to be here. But not all. I mean, for me, it felt like 90, 95% of the people were welcoming and loving. It was that 95% that made the difference, that made Mazen feel he was free to be himself. Personal freedom in Syria, on the other hand, is a dangerous proposition. Our life in Syria, is, we have a tyrant running the country. Somebody that wins election every, I don't know, every four years or so, by 99.999999 every time. And nobody dares go against him. So it's Mickey Mouse, like, how stupid, what, who? I don't like to be treated stupid. And I wanted to go live where, where it's freedom exists. Where, where the equality exists. A place where you can start 
from nothing and and be somebody where you can have a small amount of money and start a business and become successful. So that's what he did. In 1990, Mazen's parents moved from Syria to Murfreesboro, and together they opened a Middle Eastern restaurant followed by a car dealership. Mm -hmm. $7,000, that's what we had when we started Kebab Cuisine in 1990. That was our first business venture, and I was still working as a pilot part-time uh, and, and helping my family with the restaurant. So how many have we sold so far? From there, uh, we had made enough money and saved it up to where we can go to a bigger business. And that was the car business we went into. And they do just as well, but the other ones have the, the popularity. You know, Mawson's experience in Murfreesboro has been one of welcome and success. Thank you very much. We appreciate your business. But sometimes he questions how far his acceptance in the community goes. I wonder if sometimes we lose a sale because of who we are. Some people may say, regardless, I don't care if he's the nicest person in the world. He's a Muslim. He is uh, from Syria. I'm not doing business with him. That, that does exist, but I think it's a small percentage of people that are like that. For Mazen, the answer has always been the strength of one's relationships in the community, relationships he spent a lifetime building. You know, I learned what I learned here from making friends with my American neighbors. Today, he fears that model is at risk. Instead of improving, instead of getting better and being more accepting of others, it seems like America is going backwards at this point. If people got to know each other, they wouldn't stereotype they would know that person and treat him or her based on who they are, not where they're originally from and what tribe they belong to. It's the idea that we're more than just an ethnicity, religion, or nationality. We're the sum of many parts. And like the communities we live in, a true sense of belonging comes with feeling whole. I am proud to be Syrian and Muslim and American at the same time. I woke up to this world in this country. I came here, I was 18. That's why my kids are from here and I'm from here. I plan to be here for the rest of my life. Mazen's roots in Middle Tennessee continue deepening. Not only is Murfreesboro home to his wife and children, but it's become home to much of his extended family, including brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, and grandchildren. His oldest daughter, Amira, ponders just how far they've come. Times have changed for Syrian Americans. I would say that there are some things that have gotten better and there are some things that have gotten worse. When you come here from, from Syria, you know, or from any other country, Middle Tennessee has become such a melting pot that you're going to find that there are more people like you than there were, you know, when my dad started out. But in a lot of ways, it's also more difficult because you have to overcome so many stereotypes. Amira was born in the U.S. and attended high school in the early 2000s. She recalls the time when being from a Syrian family had different implications than it does today. I remember being in high school and it was me and my best friend who is from Jordan. And there weren't any other Middle Eastern kids in the school. It was like, Syria, where's that, you know? And now, if you are a Syrian American as a teenager, unfortunately, people have such a, you know, bad image in their mind. Beginning in 2011, the civil war in Syria led to a refugee crisis. Civilians fleeing the fight between government forces, various rebel factions, and ISIS fighters flooded the borders of neighboring countries and Europe. By the end of 2016, there were nearly 5 million registered Syrian refugees. Of those, about 18,000 were resettled in the U.S. In Tennessee, fewer than 400. Some have called for an end to resettling refugees from certain majority Muslim countries, fearing that terrorists could take advantage of the refugee resettlement process and compromise U.S. national security. Others insist that the United States remain open and welcoming to refugees. Yeah. 
At a vigil called We All Belong, a cross-section of individuals joined on Murfreesboro's town square. They were opposing a U.S. travel ban, which focused on immigrants and refugees from certain majority Muslim countries. The afternoon's events began with little reaction, but as night fell, a second group arrived. They were protesting the vigil in support of tougher immigration policies. For several young Muslims in the crowd, it all felt very personal. What's happening in Syria right now is very crucial. I literally tear up every single day because my family, my mom's family is from there, and that just tears my heart to actually see those children and women and wives and sisters and brothers slaughtered dead on the ground. And when they immigrate to here, they're just coming to safety. I don't know, when people come to me and say Muslims are dangerous, I said, I was like, do you even know Muslim? Have you ever met a Muslim? I feel like I'm left out. I feel like I'm a outsider, like I don't belong here anymore. I want to show people who Muslims are really are. I want to explain to them what my religion means and that my religion is a peaceful religion. In Murfreesboro, some people are looking for opportunities to diminish differences and unify the community. Abdukati is a Syrian immigrant and president of the Murfreesboro Muslim Youth. As founder of a charitable nonprofit, he's identified what he believes is the best way forward. The only way to change a community is through individualized relationships. Me and you doing something positive to the community. When these things happen, when we join hands, in doing good, relationships are created. And if someone comes and tells you this person's faith is, is bad, you're gonna look at them and laugh, because you know better. For Abdu, the idea of community and relationship building comes with a sense of urgency. It all began with a tragic event that had a profound personal impact. I received a call stating that the son of one of my friends was murdered in North Carolina in Chapel Hill, along with his wife and her sister. I flew there almost immediately. I was there within a few hours. I joined the family in the funeral, the condolences. That was a turning point for me. The three victims were Muslim students at the University of North Carolina. On February 10th, 2015, they were shot and killed in their apartment by a disgruntled neighbor with a history of being confrontational. For Abdu, this led to a moment of clarity and purpose. My realization at the end of that trip that hate is what killed them. And that's where my view shaped to give an environment, a nurturing environment that would allow the Muslim youth to reach outside their comfort zones without fear to be a visible, loud voice of justice for those around them. To show by conduct, by example, what Islam is. And that's what started the Murfreesboro Muslim Youth. Through a variety of activities, including food drives, interfaith events, and refugee resettlement work, the Murfreesboro Muslim youth make it their mission to join hands with others outside the Muslim faith. One of their most popular events is called Love Your Neighbor. Me and Jason Bennett from the Murfreesboro called Patrol came together and said, how about we do a picnic and bring the community together and let's show everyone that love stronger than hate, and here we are. The event's co-sponsor, Murfreesboro Cold Patrol, is a Christian organization that serves the local homeless population. I hope that peace comes out of this. Um, peace and, and, and love for our neighbors, no matter what our backgrounds are. According to Abdu's model, this is just one piece of a larger project aimed at bringing people together, not under a common banner, but for a common purpose. The idea was for me to join in the efforts that's already existing in my community to foster relationships, build bridges, create friendships, and demolish some of the walls of ignorance and hate. This approach seems to be gaining some traction. On a gray and soggy Saturday morning, a handful of people from the community turned out to help move furniture for some newly settled refugees. Kelsey Lampkin, a graduate student at Middle Tennessee State University, was among them. I want to 
challenge myself to be more proactive in helping people. Instead of just sharing things on Facebook, I want to actually do something useful and help somebody. People are really hurting and people actually need this help. And you know, if we don't take it upon ourselves to help out, we can't count on other people to do it. This view puts her in the same camp as fellow MTSU student and Muslim youth volunteer, Salim Spinati. It's nice to see when you're giving things to people who actually need them rather than just giving money and not knowing where it goes. I think the manpower that we give is more valuable than a lot of people see. And it's nice to see people's lives change in front of you. The next step is for them to get jobs, to feel safe within their homes. We have to let these families know that they're just like everybody else and that their hard work will pay off with love. Mohamed Salama and his family are among the refugees who've resettled in Murfreesboro. Years after escaping the missiles and bombs that devastated much of Syria, you can see a renewed sense of normalcy setting in the kind of everyday happiness that comes with a stable job, secure home, and healthy family. He's hoping for a good life, God willing, and for his kids to have an education and to live a safe life. The toughest part has been just getting used to life here and the language barrier, but it's slowly getting better and it's getting easier day by day. Some things, however, remain painfully difficult. The one thing that he always worries about is his mom that is still in Syria. It's been five years since he's seen her, and it's just, that's the constant worry that he has. Families ripped apart. It's one of the steepest prices anyone pays during wartime. And for Syrians today, no one is left untouched. Like Mohammed, Abdu worries daily for his sister and her family, who've been trapped in the war-torn Syrian city of Aleppo. Every morning we wake up thinking we're going to hear that one of them is dead. Every morning. Every time the phone rings from Syria, we think it's going to be bad news. And I can't do anything about it. Syrians overseas, I can't help them. My sister in Syria, I can't help her. Those who are coming here today, after being vetted by the United States government, adopted by agencies. Do I have an obligation to help them? Absolutely I do. I believe we all do. Now, is everyone willing to take to do that? No, not everyone is willing to do that. So the question remains, will Syrian refugees be at home in their new communities? And will Middle Tennessee remain a welcoming place for Muslim immigrants? Abdu is hopeful. There are so many people out there who are wanting to join hands with you to show love and strength in the community. Because really and truly, the majority of our community is a loving community, is a peaceful community. What it takes is for us to be there among them, to realize it. The need for acceptance is something most people can relate to. But at one point or another, nearly everyone feels like they simply don't fit in. This is a common theme for adolescents and young adults, those trying to find their unique place in the world. But how many teenagers have had to question their very citizenship? What would it be like to wake up one day and realize that you may not be welcome in the country you've called home? The woman in our next story has given that question some serious thought. Carla calls the United States home. Though she was born in Mexico, her memories are distant, recalling a turbulent home life fueled by an abusive father. Her mother, a victim of domestic violence, chose to flee Mexico and make a new life beyond the border, far away from her abusive husband. Carla and her sister followed close in tow. I moved to Nashville when I was five years old, and so I started kindergarten in Nashville, and I went through the Metro Nashville public school system. I did grow up with a lot of people who were not Mexican. They're all born here in Nashville. They're all American. And just growing up, you know, my friends, we played ball in the park. We went to the movies, went bowling. We had sleepovers. So I felt like I was one of them. I mean, it wasn't until high school that I realized that I was different. In high school, when we were doing research for colleges. I needed a social security number, and I asked my mom if I had one and if she could give it to me. And then that's when she told me that I didn't have a social security number. Um, and that's when I realized that my life would never be the same and that I was different, that I wasn't like my friends, that a number and 
documents separated me more than I could ever imagine. Many undocumented youth do not learn of their immigration status until they're making the transition to young adulthood. Suddenly, they're faced with obstacles that separate them from their documented peers. Without documents, they are legally barred from getting a driver's license or federal student aid. For Carla, having her identity shaken also made her feel isolated and alone. You just hear of people who are undocumented and you hear these really negative things, and so I was really ashamed. Probably a week after I found out that I was undocumented, I went and spoke to my guidance counselor and I kind of asked her what options do I have for college, for my future. She just told me that I should go back to Mexico because she didn't think that I had a future here. After I walked the graduation stage, I didn't know what was going to happen and I kind of saw all my dreams shatter. The comfort she had known growing up in Nashville was replaced with a constant nagging fear. It was a really great risk to even be out in public. Um, you could get deported at any time. I kind of had to live my life with caution and I didn't drive and I didn't try to get a job as soon as I graduated because I was afraid that I was gonna get deported to a country that I had not gone back to since I was five years old. Carla spent the next year guarding her secret, pushing her deeper into solitude. But she would soon discover that there were others like her battling the same doubts and looking for answers. The summer after I graduated high school, I got the opportunity to be involved in a nonprofit called TURK. TURK stands for Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition. As a member of their youth group known as JOMP, Carla found a cohort of like-minded individuals with similar goals and challenges. I really learned what it meant to be someone who was undocumented and unafraid. I'd spent most of my the senior year being undocumented and very afraid, and so that summer it was kind of being re-energized, and that meant kind of being brave and speaking to our senator. In 2010, Carla and her friends from Turk took their fight all the way to the Capitol. She and fellow Dreamers would lobby their senator to support the DREAM Act. This legislation would have given undocumented immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children a path to citizenship by serving in the military or going to college. We wanted for him to vote yes on the DREAM Act because we wanted to go to college, wanted to work. I would end so hopeful and really hoping that he would say yes because you're a Tennessean and I support you. The DREAM Act was defeated in a Senate vote. Carla, confronted with a dwindling sense of hope and increased isolation, withdrew from her friends and family. I started blaming my mom for bringing me to the United States. I forgot the little girl that was five years old that saw her dad almost murder her mom and kind of forgetting why she even brought me to the United States in the first place. I wanted to get away from my mom because I blamed her for my situation. And so for a whole year, I didn't talk to my mom at all just because I was so angry and I was just so lost and so hopeless. Carla's situation wasn't sustainable in the long term. She still had dreams, but couldn't achieve them in isolation. It meant she'd have to make peace, if not with her circumstance, then at least with the person she needed most. It was so hard to reconcile with my mom because I had to kind of accept that I was wrong. So many things have changed since being you know, a 19-year-old angry at the world. I admire her hard work. I admire how she gets up every morning and she takes my sisters to school and she cooks, but she also goes and helps my stepdad with construction work. And so she's a superwoman. Anytime I feel like giving up, I remember that I'm not the dreamer, that my mom is the original dreamer and parents like herself, they are the ones that originally dreamed of a better life for us. For a time, that dream appeared to be in jeopardy. Then in 2012, DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, came along. This policy protects childhood arrivals who meet certain criteria from being deported for a two-year period. It also allows a work permit and allows them to obtain a driver's license. DACA has given me a new meaning for life. You know, it's an opportunity for me to be able to live legally in the United States. And so I had a social security number and a, a way to be able to work. Also, I was able to finish my degree. And so with my degree, what I'm doing now is that I'm helping students that want to go to college, those people that were just like me their senior year, trying to figure out where to go. 
I want to be someone that can help them and give them options and not be the person that says you don't have any options, your only options to go back to the country where you're from. DACA, however, could be terminated at any time, leaving Carla nervous about her future prospects. Even the idea of DACA being repealed, it's a really scary thought because it's like I can't drive anymore, I can't work anymore. More people are going to be at risk for deportation and more students that have spent several years outside of the country they were born, they're going to have to go back to this country that sometimes they don't know the language, don't know the culture. It's a stark reality, but one that she's forced to confront, no matter the outcome. All through high school and even after graduating high school, I was so afraid to tell people that I was undocumented because I was afraid that I was going to lose my job. I was afraid of what my friends would think of me. Um, I was afraid of putting the people that I cared about in danger of them getting deported because they were also undocumented. And then all of a sudden, I just realized that, you no, know, like Tennessee's my home. It's the place where I grew up. There's people that I love here. There's other students out there that are trying to find the courage to be undocumented and unafraid. And so even though it, you know, being public and sharing your story about being documented could possibly cost me to get deported. And I just really want people to find the strength to share their story because even though one person might have not changed their view on what a documented person is or what their life looks like, maybe there's someone else out there that might identify or see their daughter, their neighbor, their friend through me. Thank you for watching Next Door Neighbors Belonging. You can find all our stories online anytime at WNPT.org slash nextdoorneighbors. Next Door Neighbors is made possible by the support of the Nissan Foundation.